Paul Kreitman and I teach 20th century Japanese history here at Columbia University. Uh, today I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hirokazu Yoshie. Dr. Yoshie first studied uh, at Sophie University in Tokyo before moving on to do his graduate work at Harvard University where he defended his PhD, uh, Quotidian Monarchy, the Emperor's Portrait in Everyday Life. From there, he moved on to a position at uh, Nichibunken uh, in Kyoto and is now uh, a lecturer at the Faculty of International Arts at Sofia University uh, back in Tokyo again. And he'll present today an off, uh, an off cut from the dissertation, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, under the title of Nostalgic Ethnocentrism Organized Shinto's Efforts to Restore the Imperial Rescript on Education in Post War Japan. So I will turn things over to you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for um, making time to be here despite the weather. And thank you. I also want to thank Julie and everybody at the Weatherhead Center Institute for making all these arrangements. It's a great opportunity for me. And also, I want to thank everybody in Zoom for, for joining me today. Now I'm going to share my Okay, so as Paul introduced, my topic is about the rescript um, education. Before I, I say any more words about this, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this text. I was wondering what come to mind about this text. I mean, before you saw my talk advertised, when you when you hear the rescript and education, what do you know? What, what do you associate this text with. Let me, since we have a small cloud, maybe let me give you five seconds to, to refresh and remember. Okay, Professor uh, uh, Friedman. Uh, I, uh, I haven't studied it in any detail, but mm -hmm. my impression is that uh, we're talking about the very conservative or traditional values. Okay, okay. It has that's great. Uh, it associated with very traditional values, so it's supported generally by conservatives, LDP politicians who probably want to bring Japan maybe back to the state before the war. So, Jeffrey, did you have any? Yeah, I think of like nation building and citizen. Okay. Okay. Citizen craft. Yeah, citizen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so it was definitely a key tool for you know, developing a nation around the authority of the emperor. So that's great. Are there any other impressions or? Yeah, I think of emperor worship. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. The centrality of, of the emperor as a figure to mm -hmm. be uh, idolized mm -hmm. in the education system. That's true, that's true. So again, it was used as a tool of cultivation of emperor worship. So, Thank you. I'm sorry, may I ask your name again? Gabriel. Gabriel, thank you. So I've been teaching uh, in Japan. When I ask my students about this, I gotta admit half the students, they don't really know what this is about. The students who know what this is, they usually associate the text in one of the two ways or maybe both. So um, as many of you already mentioned, uh, it is associated um, as a tool of uh, cultivation of the worship before the war, before the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Or um, a good number of students always refer to the text as an uh, object of controversy that they see, they watch in the media. Politicians, journalists, scholars, every five or 10 years, there's a huge debate about 
what, we, what what should we do about the rest script? And what, you know, should we just restore it? Or should we just get rid of it? And that's um, another big association. Uh, so, what I wanted to do today is to sort of fill this gap, you know, bridge the gap between this uh, major interpretation about the rest group. We know a lot about how the rest group, we as historians, we know a lot about how the rest group was mobilized in pre-war Japan. Some of us know very well that the rest group is an object of controversy. And my, one of my questions today is how does this rest script as a tool of loyalty and patriotism turn into an object of controversy? And I'm hoping that what I'm going to talk about today is going to be one way to help us understand, help us um, make connections between the rest script before the war and what we know about the rest script today. In other words, I, I do think that the restoration movement initiated by Shinto priests, that was uh, one of the triggers or that was placed um, at the beginning of this controversy on um, the rest script that we see a lot today. So I do get a sense that a lot of you have a good idea of what the rest script is, but let me give you some of the what I think basics to, uh, because they will be relevant to my argument later. So it was issued in 1980. Maybe the year itself isn't really important, but what's important was that it was issued right after the promulgation of a, a Meiji constitution, because Meiji leaders believe that now that they, they instituted the legal framework of a modern civil rights nation, it's time for them to turn to the spiritual integration of the nation. So they decided to issue this document, the rest of uh, education, and they distributed its copies to, uh, to every public school where on uh, imperial holidays, they, the, they read the rest of Or when there are no holidays, the rest of was still very important to many school children. Uh, it, it appeared in many occasions like in classes of ethics, teachers refer to some instructions in the rest script, or in teaching Japanese or Chinese characters, they refer to the rest script, pick some characters. So it was part of the educational life for people in pre-war and wartime Japan. <laughs> this rest script lost its authority when it was officially invalidated in the parliament. 1948. Um, we know why this happened. It happened because the uh, occupiers, the occupation forces, they wanted to democratize Japan, and they believe that this rest script is one of the things that are in, in, that are preventing Japanese democratization. It's a pretty short text, and uh, when we think about its characteristics, I. Summarize it into three. One is that um, the text was intentionally written so that uh, it's, it looks like a sort of a letter that Emperor is sort of writing to, writing was uh, addressing his subjects. It was not an uh, objective legal document. So, uh, for example, uh, it's pretty obvious if you read the, if you read the text. You know, the way the language is used. So if you, you look expression that like, yay yeah, our subjects. And I don't know if this is commonsensical to maybe in the English, but my students didn't know. So our in this case isn't a singular, I mean it, it's not our the way we use it, but it was a um, singular first pronoun that um people like uh, uh, kings and emperors used. So it was my subjects, and that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And throughout the text, it's also obvious that Japan is a land of emperor. Japan, uh, imperial institution is central. And the Emperor Meiji asked his subject to, to give their 100% in order to protect 
the imperial institution. Um, that's that. So we see many other examples here. Uh, for example, if you look at number two, our or my imperial ancestor have found in my empire. It's all about the imperial institution. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at number three, uh, number two and three at the bottom of the slide, um, this is a very uh, symbolic sentence that is quoted quite often. Should I imagine? Excuse me. Going back to number three. So the emperor um, gives specific instructions, specific ways in which people devote themselves. Some of the instructions are very generic, like as had found in wives, be harmonious or obey the constitution. And um, some are very specific to imperial Japan, like this sentence, should imagine your wise, offer yourself courageously to the state and thus God and maintain the prosperity of my our imperial throne, coeval with heaven and earth. So the reason why I decided to focus on the West Group in the past four decades was that I encountered a puzzle or question about this West Group, the way it was referenced in post-war Japan. And this is my topic. Uh, I encountered this historical phenomenon um, campaign to restore the West Group in education. Chokubo Kaifu was a Japanese expression. Shinto priests often used. It started in 1969, and they did a lot of things. Before I forget, when I say they, it was this um, particular group, Association of Shinto Shrines, it's called Jinja Honcho. It is not a government agency. It is a private umbrella religious organization that oversees other Shinto shrines all over Japan. It's optional whether you participate in this organization or not, but more than 95% of Shinto shrines in Japan, there are about 80,000 shrines, they participate. So they're members, they pay an annual fee, and that's the main source of income for the association. And it was founded in 1946, Again, maybe the year is not important, but it's important because it was founded in response to the, the termination of state support. Again, by the US occupiers, they thought that's another sort of anti-democratic principles. So they cut the ties between Shinto ideology and state. So they, Shinto priests, they went, up, went ahead and founded their own organization to preserve the rights and privileges that they had before. So we, you see a lot of things that they did in order to restore the respite, making copies, put, putting them in the frame, selling them for fee, or funding publication projects for kids or for adults about the respite. Or you see the summer camps for school children who were sending petitions over and over again to prime ministers, um, Minister of Education and other influential LDP politicians. One thing that particularly caught my eye was this modern translation, which was completed in 1972. Instead of making people recite the original Japanese, which happened sometimes, but the main focus was to use their translation when they talk about the respite. And I found this translation is, I found this translation strange. So that's my first question. And I'll tell you how, how strange it is in a minute. I have two questions. That's my first question. The second question I have, why late 1960s? I mean, I know that I, I've heard Shinto priest always complain about US occupation, always complain about they are forced to remove all, they are forced, forcibly removing the restaurant. But this restoration did not start in 1952 when the occupiers left. It started a little later. So this timing of the restoration movement is another question that I have. So here's um, 
some of the examples of why I think this is French. So on the left, you see official translation, English translation done by the Japanese government in 1907. On the right, uh, it's my English translation of um, their modern Japanese translation in 1972. Remember those three characteristics, and none of those characteristics of the reference is represented in the translation. I mean, our imperial ancestors have founded our empire. Now that became that tra what was translated as, I believe, that our ancestors. It's very unclear who is speaking to who. And I think grammatically, our ancestors sound like they are referring to Japanese people's ancestors instead of imperial family. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, our subjects, that very didactic language is gone. Everyone in the nation. Or this historic symbolic sentence, should emergency arise of yourselves. That became, quote, if an emergency occurs, you must fully render service for the peace and safety of the country. This was it. I mean, look at the original sentence. They talk, you know, they ask you to protect the imperial throne. It just turned into a very generic statement of patriotism. So we see all of these three characteristics either de emphasized or concealed. So, my assumption here is that this is not accidental. There's some agenda, some intention behind it. And I got curious to know more about why. No Shinto priest explained why they did the translating text this way. So I, I have to collect evidence and speculate. How did I do that? I focused on their official bulletin. It was called Jinja Shinpo. It's, uh, it was issued weekly, Shinpo Association Foundation, 1946. It's just about four pages, sometimes six, but usually four pages. Um, I, I wasn't able to find how much um, the subscription fee was, but now today it's about 8,000 yen a year, about let's say $50, $60 US dollars a year. And when it was issued in the 1940s, about 80,000 copies were issued, sold. Today, they sell about 50,000 copies. And again, I was not able to get a comprehensive data, but I guess this gives us a sense of the influence that this bulletin had. It's not that, it's not that every single Shinto priest actually avidly read the bulletin, but maybe it's, you have in some way gave Shinto priests the sense that you have to be familiar with the main discussions um, in the bulletin. So reading, I, I spent time reading this bulletin uh, in the second half of that uh, issued in the second half of the 20th century. And um, I came to the conclusion that um, I, I, I came up with my answers to the questions I have about the timing. Um, they were prioritizing other issues that they, the association judged to be more important. And also they were waiting for specific impetus for the restoration movement to gain momentum. About this dilution in content, it was um, for the association of Shinto shrines, the rescript was very ideal because it was a very symbolic, um, it's a symbol, spiritual symbol of overcoming uh, US occupation. But uh, they knew that they were doing this restoration in post war Japan, so they have to be pragmatic and adapt their text, adapt the uh, politically incorrect rescript to post war Japan. So let me talk more about um, these answers. So I want to first start off by talking a little more about what Shinto priests were doing before the restoration movement started. I mean, one, if we identify one agenda or one thing that the community of Shinto priests wanted throughout the post war years, even until today, it's it's this 
shared anger at US occupation and shared anger at what they did to disintegrate state Shinto. And as part of this agenda, the risk group in education was referenced sometimes. But when the occupied left in 1952, their concern was more legal or more official. First, they, they thought about um, uh, revising the constitution, which they believed was imposed by the Americans, which didn't really work out very well because they learned that there's a broad support among the nation for the current constitution. Then they turned to um, a specific tradition that was eliminated by US occupiers. That's the Imperial Foundation Day. Again, the US occupiers got rid of it because they thought that's against their version of democracy. Um, in a way, this movement to restore the Imperial Foundation Day was a success. They, uh, they collaborated with many other right-wing groups like the Association of Green Families, and they were happy to make compromises when necessary because they knew that in order to make this a law, they have to convince um, conservative politicians. And even conservative politicians didn't just want to restore this law because it, it sounds very imperial, imperial foundation day, and by definition, that uh, signifies the, the first day uh, when the imperial dynasty started, the first gap of the imperial family was born. So as a result, it was legalized but with a slightly different name in National Foundation Day, and that was legalized in 1967. And on the slide, you see uh, this image of the of the, one of the political rallies for this restoration movement. And one thing I want to emphasize here is that if you read what Shinto priests wrote at around this time, they were they always emphasized uh, idea of pragmatism. And if you look at one of the memoirs, official recollection of the movement. This is what I um, have on the slide. They said, one lesson we learned from the effort to legalize the Foundation Day is to remove from our gender anything that cannot get widespread support among the nation, no matter how beneficial it will be to the community of Shinto priests. So it seems like this pragmatism was one of the lessons that they learned uh, through the process failed effort to revise the constitution and more or less successful effort to legalize the imperial, excuse me, legalize the national foundation. I'll come back to this point of pragmatism in a minute. So when the holiday was legalized in 1967, the association leadership they now shifted their attention to what they thought was spiritual revitalization of the Japanese people. Now, uh, legally, they had some success. Now they have to do something about this spiritual crisis in their eyes, spiritual crisis of the nation. And association leadership for association leaders, this was a, a great time because in uh, 1968, now the nation, the government, they are celebrating a uh, 100 year anniversary of the Meiji constitution. <laughs> so um, they thought so it's, it's time and they uh, started, association leaders started this campaign called Spiritual Development Movement. Um, sorry, there's a title on the slide, not stuff group, but study, they founded study groups or lectures, they founded uh, publications so that Shinto priests, uh, so that they do Shinto priests learn how to inform the public about great Shinto tradition. But I try to understand what they are actually doing. It's a little ambiguous because they didn't really talk much about concrete details. They always talk about we have to spiritually revitalize people. 
but they don't really come with specific examples. Even the respiratory medication wasn't really mentioned in the initial years of the movement. This all changed in 1969 when the nation and the media was shocked by this incident at Tokyo University, which was supposed to be the, at the top of the academic hierarchy. So in January 1969, um, student activists who are more or less influenced by socialist thoughts, they were making uh, demands to improve the, the educational environments of their campus. Um, the university leadership refused, and as a response, those students decided to occupy this um, symbolic building of the university, yes, the auditorium, uh, in protest. And the university leaders, leadership, they responded by inviting, by asking the police to intervene. So as a result, the police came in and they got rid of the students. They arrested most of them. And that sent shockwaves throughout the nation. So if you read newspapers, if you uh, listen to political speeches, everybody was trying to make sense of this. So there's a lot of discussion about academic freedom, um, the role of higher education. Uh, I, I also have an image of the one on the anniversary uh, on top right, and we see uh, activist students on the bottom right, and we see the USL auditorium paying uh, voice attention in the picture in color. So that was a big trigger for the association. This uh, symbolic event, a bunch of students resorting to violence, was very uh, was a, a the symbolic event. Uh, it's a, it, it was symbolic of the dysfunctional state of post-war education, and it was symbolic of the failure of what U.S. occupiers did. And then that event gave them an excuse, gave them a reason, a momentum towards restoring the rescript. So only after the, and very quickly after this campus activism, we see association leaders <coughs> proposing uh, restoration of the rescript. So I have this long quote. Uh, it's long, but this summarizes this argument or the, the reasoning that they, they use for the restoration. So they said uh, in one article from 1969, they said it, it is clear that the university question cannot be solved simply by the use of the police force. But the crux of the matter is to establish a spiritual foundation, foundation of education. And since the spirit of the rescript and education was denied and excluded during the US occupation, higher education remained void of the spiritual foundation. It is most imperative to fill this spiritual vacuum. Without doing so, there's no, no way to eliminate the forces of rebellion in universities. This was new. Before this, the bulletin talked about the rescript sometimes. They praised some specific uh, sentence in the rest script. Well, that, that was that. Nobody really said we have to restore the rest script in contemporary Japan. Now this became um, possible. So this is where we can go back to uh, one of the slides I shared on the, the restoration movement, the publications, print copies, summer camps, So I guess now it's clear why the restoration movement started in 1969. But what about this translation? The other question that I have. To me, one way to explain the dilution in content was their effort to try to pragmatically get out of the dilemma. Again, as I mentioned earlier, 
for the association leaders, the wrestling was very ideal. It was it was a um, spiritual symbol of achieving their agenda, spiritual symbol of overcoming US occupation. But they had to be pragmatic. I mean, that's one lesson they learned from the earlier decades. And if you want to be pragmatic, they knew that its content is just unacceptable. So in order to solve this dilemma, they came up with these two solutions. One is to don't really talk about the content. Don't really talk about what's written in the wrestler. Try to sell the wrestler as a whole. And still, if you want to restore the respect, you you know you have to maybe there will be you know, there is a situation where you have to talk about what's written in there. So why don't you just translate the original text into a more politically correct um, Japanese? And ironically, it was um, that agenda or that intention uh, was probably powerful, uh, was pretty clear. Uh, as Henry Shingo, for example, helps see through his intention. And when the translation came out, one of the articles sort of sarcastically said that this translation was, is now literally translated uh, in strangely, weirdly, sucks up to present day norms and behave itself or your So, in a way, they were successful in concealing the political incorrect principles of the rest of Let me talk a little more about the first solution, solution one. What did I mean by selling the rest as a whole and not mentioning the content? Not mentioning the content, it was, um, that's what they did. At least if you read the bulletin, before 1969, people talked about the content, specific uh, values. They just stopped talking about that. I stopped seeing any article in which they talk, they refer to a specific content. And instead, they trying to emphasize the like, historic role or emphasize the greatness of the rescript as a whole. So for example, you see uh, many articles that emphasize the rescript historic, or to me, even theatrical role. For example, if you look at the quote on the left, um, they said in the early Meiji, people and society were confused. But in the Meiji's promulgation of the restaurant, united the nation instantly. Given this fact, we must restore the restaurant as a solution to the state of moral and um, spiritual confusion that we observe today. We also see this strategy of selling the West script because it served people in pre-war Japan very well, pre-war, uh, immediate post-war Japan. So we see a lot of anecdotes. Uh, for example, people during the war, they were hungry, but they survived the hardship, but this family was survived the hardship because they, they read the West script every day. Or when the war ended, there's, a, there's another family, father and son, who um, um, was not able to bring a lot of things back to Japan, but they got a copy of the rescue because that was crucial, that was central to their spiritual um, life. We see stories like this in the selling the rescue as a whole, not without mentioning specific content. And also, we see uh, this red script um, mobilized as a sign of this uh, unfair history. So we see uh, many articles after 1969 where they give a detailed analysis or they give a lot of information about the exact process uh, in the way the red script was removed. So this article from 1970, reflection on background and process of revolution of invalidation in post war Japan. Um, before 1969, it was just about complaint. You know, people just said, priests just said, Americans don't want to be rescued. 
now they are trying to give you the more details to convince the readers about this historical fact. As I was doing this research, one another question I had was how did it end? It's not very clear because uh, as I read the bulletin, no one really announced the end of the movement. No one really said the movement ended in success or failure. It just tapered off the momentum. I mean, in the 70s, Shinto priests talked a lot about this restoration. In the 80s, I didn't see many articles. People just stopped being interested. I still, I am still trying to figure out why this was the case. And this is one area where uh, I feel I have to do research. But I, my, my hypothesis for now was that it was not politically effective. I mean, despite this lesson that they learned about pragmatism, this restoration maybe wasn't really a smart move. I mean, first of all, its agenda was pretty ambiguous. I mean, if you compare this with the earlier movement, like legalization of an imperial holiday, whether you agree or disagree, it's very concrete, right? We can imagine what they want to do. When you hear Shinto priests say, restore the rest group, what does that even mean? I mean, the rest group in education wasn't really a law before the war, uh, in pre war Japan. So, restoration come in different shapes. So, it was very ambiguous. And maybe in relation to that, I don't think there was a big support for the restoration movement, at least compared to earlier movements. I mean, about the imperial holiday, there were some opinion polls and that suggests that there was a widespread support. There's no opinion polls for the restoration movement. Maybe that itself suggests that people do, there wasn't really a broad support in the nation. Even within the community of Shinto priests, there were some signs of reservation. Like this example I have on my slide. One priest from the Oita prefecture, uh, he contributed this piece saying that, quote, the campaign to restore the respect on education is just unacceptable to society today. The association leaders, leadership incessantly promotes anachronistic right wing agendas out of obsession with the US occupation. I'm disappointed to not see policies that reflect the vitality of most of Japan. I don't know um, how many priests how um, how many priests share this criticism, but to me this is important because I didn't see this kind of criticism on all your movement. So this indicates some sense of disagreement even among the community. <laughs> So this movement ended without producing concrete results. But I still do think that this movement is historically significant because this is placed at the beginning of this long lasting controversy on the rescript from education that we see even today. You know, when this translation and restoration campaign started, the media, especially Asahi, and to some extent, Yomiuri, they followed the campaign. They were critical about this campaign. And they criticized the Association of Shinto Shrines for being uh, militaristic or unconstitutional. Soon afterwards, 1974, there started this controversy 
in the parliament among politicians. It started when Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Tanaka, suddenly proposed that we have to restore the respite. I'm not sure about the colder relationship here. I know that the association sent petition to the Prime Minister and other political politicians. So I, I can say this was a result of the association restoration movement, but they are sharing this moment of postural controversy. So when Prime Minister Tanaka uh, said we have to restore the respite because it has great value, um, it's applicable today. Um, they, Tanaka and his fellows, they were criticized for again being unconstitutional, etc. And in response to that liberal criticism, Tanaka and others suggested that that criticism itself is misguided because they were brainwashed by US occupiers. They don't go, they never say that far. And as you can tell from this uh, response of Prime Minister Tanaka, so in the diet, he was criticized for praising the text that was invalidated in 1948. He said, he just said this, when the rescript was invalidated, I was young and sensitive. So I remember very vividly that the diet issued resolutions in response to the memo of the occupation forces. It's subtle, I mean, as a prime minister, I guess you can just you know go about and say, Americans are all bad. Uh, we can get a sense that this is responding to the criticism you know, by saying that you guys are distorted, not us. <clears throat> so this controversy, a very sort of, in a way, divided controversy, became a sort of template for what came afterwards. So after, uh, every five or 10 years after this controversy, uh, we see a very similar discussion or debate going on in Japanese politics and in Japanese media. And this is one of the most recent examples that I heard. So this uh, happened in 19, excuse me, 2016, 2017. This controversy started when the media learned that um, this couple and this guy, uh, he was running a number of kindergartens in Osaka. He had a very ultra-nationalistic agenda. And the media learned that he was making his pupils re recite the respite on education in morning sessions and when the kindergarten had visitors. And the media got interested even more because they learned that this guy is very well connected to LGBT politicians. Mm -hmm. So we see now in the middle of the picture, we see the wife of former prime minister, Abe. Let me, to help you get a sense of this, uh, what he was doing. Let me share a short clip about this practice. I think I need, I want to share the screen again. Hey,
Sorry, give me a, give me a few seconds. Okay, so you saw the video in the first few seconds, you saw kids reciting the rest script. When I, when I saw this, uh, I had many questions. Do the kids really understand what they're saying? Or once they graduate, do they become more nationalistic than the average? Well, what was the pedagogical effect of all of this? They are my questions, but the point I want to make here is that you see that video, you know, we can have different kinds of discussion. We have a lot of these you know, questions, but what I found interesting here is that, okay, go to my next page. Discussion, controversy that followed was very stereotypical. People were just basically recycling, repeating the template or the type of discussion they have in the 1970s. We see journalists, scholars saying that this pedagogy was unconstitutional, it's militaristic, and we see conservative politicians, some journalists um, defending the, the rest script, saying that it has great values, it, uh, its virtues are applicable to today. And when they're criticized, again, sometimes they respond by indicating that that criticism itself is misguided. Mm. I have a quote from Sankei Shimbun that says, critics bother to refer to diet resolution, but it was uh, in fact issued because the scab or US occupiers demanded, demanded it and Japan was under occupation. <laughs> So that's how, uh, in, that, in that way, I want to go back to uh, one of the earlier slides. The uh, restoration movement itself didn't produce any concrete results, but uh, its historical significance lies in the fact that it salvaged this um, um, legacy of pre war Japan and turn that into an object of political controversy that we see even today to some extent. Okay, um, this is all I have. So thank you so much. Thank you, that was uh, fascinating. Um, so I think we'll have time for everyone to ask sure. all the questions they want luckily. So I'm gonna allow myself to ask the first question. Um, in fact, it's, it's two questions that might be the same question underneath. Uh, I haven't worked it out myself. So I was struck um, towards the end of your talk, you said that the the kind of the political objectives of this campaign remain ambiguous and unclear. Mm -hmm. And that's at the heart of this thing, like what were they actually trying to achieve? Because mm -hmm. there is itself just a piece of paper, it's just a text. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it kind of really about? Or what, what were the kind of political implications of, of restoring it, whatever it might be? And so, two ways I had of trying to work out what the actual objectives might have been were to think about first teachers and the second I suppose like money um mm. so for teachers if I recall from reading Professor Gluck's book as a grad student many years ago mm. one of the purposes of the rescript in, in the first place was to try and basically um impose some kind of control on teachers mm. I just so what I think one clause was that teachers should not be involved in politics mm -hmm. um and so and so I I think you can read it as an attempt by the state to stop teachers from saying all kinds of subversive or, or you know, or controversial things mm -hmm. and try and yeah, impose some kind of uniformity on, on what teachers were doing and their role in, in education. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in many ways, I think you could an analogize it to the kind of panic of critical race theory at the moment in the US. Sorry, the, 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 the panic over critical race theory in the US, mm -hmm. where you have conservatives panicking that you have all these lefty teachers mm -hmm. who are teaching all these weird things to mm -hmm. students and passing laws banning critical race theory is their kind of defensive reaction where it's like, we have to stop this. We have to stop these, these radical teachers from indoctrinating kids and stuff that's just not, not what we approve of. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's kind of what, you, and you'd imagine in the 60s too, right? When you have, you know, Waseda student protesting and stuff, and mm -hmm. there would have been a huge concern that teachers in Japanese schools were, mm -hmm. were socialists and communists, right? So was it a way of trying to, 
mm. assert control over the, this curriculum and mm. the, the, the restoration would then kind of be a way of somehow stopping those kind of, as they would see it, like radical mm. excesses. So that's, that's, that's one question. Mm. Uh, and the second is about like money or patronage mm. in that, as you pointed out, Ginger Honcho had two reasons to really be upset about mm -hmm. a scap, right? First, first is the kind of ideological objection, theological objection of kind of removing shit of public sphere and the fact it's a foreign opposition and stuff. Mm -hmm. But also they took away their money, right? Scap, mm -hmm. it based, basically cut off shrines from that sort of public support they had mm -hmm. until the end of the war. And was the campaign partly an attempt to get back some of that patronage to, to kind of reassert a role in education that had been taken away? Uh, so was there a kind of material objective that they were mm. trying to attain as well as just this kind of abstract mm -hmm. restoration? Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would say yes to both questions. Mm. The first one, uh, I think you pretty much said it right. Mm. Um, I mean, that was true. The Shinto priest, they were very much concerned about the teachers. Mm. Teachers back then was more liberal, mm -hmm. um, left-wing, they uh, were associated with communism. And actually that's one of them, another major concern for Shinto priest, uh, as I read the bulletin, because um, all the time they were complaining about those teachers. You see those sort of uh, articles with scandalous tone. Look at this teacher. This teacher uh, forced the students not to uh, pay obeisance, not, not to pay respect to the national flag. They are really bad teacher. Look, and then sometimes that's connected to their uh, institutional agenda. Well, very often, actually, they say, look, this is what Americans did. This is what occupation did. So we have to restore um, pre-war state. Mm -hmm. So definitely, um, this restoration campaign, uh, I don't think they, they always connected the rest group to teachers, but definitely they were connected um, in terms of the, the underlying agenda. But I didn't really, think about that. So thank you. Thank you. That helps a lot. Second question, I would say yes, but that's something I'm not sure about. Mm. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, making copies and selling them in a frame for fee. And it was about 3,000 yen. And I don't, again, I didn't really figure this out, but assuming that the yen was, I don't know, a tenth the value that we have, it's pretty expensive, maybe. $2,000 or so. So there was, no, that's not really what you said. What you said was restoring the privileges that they had. So, so yeah, if so, we read um, Jason Ananda Josephson's book, The Invention of Religion in Japan, for our seminar, um, Gabriel and, and Jason Fugged it. Um, and so, and also, as you know, like Joe Lynn Thomas was my senpai at, mm -hmm. at Princeton. So, and they're both making the argument that essentially during the Meiji through the, the mm -hmm. end of the war, Shinto was kind of a secular belief mm -hmm. system, right? That had state support. Mm -hmm. And then in 1945, it gets kind of privatized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you buy that framework, you can see what they're doing. This is a kind of a campaign to re-secularize Shinto. Oh, to kind, right. Mm -hmm. Right. To kind of re, to basically re regain public patronage to support and say, we should have a role. Mm -hmm. We'll get money from the state, but also have a role in education, which mm -hmm. would be resources too. Definitely. I would say that um, that's why they wanted to restore the rest script. And also they were trying to legalize, um, nationalize the Yaskuni Shrine, for example. Um, they, I, I think that explains a lot of things that they did. Um, yeah, uh, legalization of the shrine. Um, uh, also, they were trying to make the emperor uh, do more of the Shinto rights and trying to make them public. Mm. So they were doing a lot of campaigns and the risk script on education was part of that mm. strategy. And I think that's why we saw the type of criticism we saw uh, on the slide. There's this one guy who said that the association is just too anachronistic. They are so obsessed about pre war Japan. Um, I, I think he was right. I mean, whether you use the negative language or not um, is up to you, but the idea that they were obsessed about what they had before the war. I mean, the association itself was founded in response to the termination of state support. So it was, I don't think they, they, made, they made it a secret. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you. Um, so I want to open the floor now to questions. Um, if you're watching online, please put your, your question or comment in the Q&A box and I will um, I'll, I'll pass it on. Uh, Gabriel. Yeah, um, I also have two questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll ask the first one first. Um, I'm also very, very interested in 
this concept of the ambiguity mm. of what exactly they were trying to achieve. Actually, on the, were they trying to get the re-script in its original form adopted? And so the translation is just there for people to understand mm -hmm. that this is what it actually means. Mm -hmm. Or were they trying to get the translation accepted as the um, the real the, the real rescript mm. in the in the translated context? Mm -hmm. Because in the video that you showed, they were reciting the original. Mm -hmm. like they were not reciting the translation. So mm -hmm. is the translation an interpretation of the original or a remake? Of the original, that the translation is the goal. The goal is to is to recognize the translation rather than the original copy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's my question. Thank you, Gabriel. I gotta say I don't know. Um, that's I don't know, in part because I should have done more research, but also in part because they don't tell you. I mean, I guess that's one character. That's one way to characterize this whole movement. Everybody said, we have to restore the rescript. And there are study groups, there are frame copies, but the association leaderships never laid out the plan. In order to restore the, the, the rescript, we have to do A, B, and C. They just supported whoever was trying to restore the rescript. I don't know how to make sense of this. Is that because does it, is that a reflection of their lack of interest in the movement? Or maybe is that sort of somehow the nature of the rest group? I mean, the rest group in, in education was pretty ambiguous in free world Japan as well. I mean, its, it's legal status was very ambiguous. It was not really a law, but it's still an important document. So when you actually um, treat the tax, the physical tax disrespectfully, you, you are punished for lazy majesty. So it, it had a ambiguous status, and that was the case in post-war Japan. Um, so to your question, I don't think that the association wanted to actually make the translation official. They they had the translation, they distributed its copies, they talked about it, but um, I don't think that was, I, I, I never got the impression that that was their top priority. If anything, they don't really want to talk about what's in the text. That's that's the impression I got. They always want to talk about its historical context, its its role as a talisman to me. Um, I like that word. I pride, I secretly pride myself uh, for coming up with that word, like a martyr talisman. Uh, they want to use the rescue as um, I don't know as a whole. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Gabriel. I don't think I'm answering your question. No, no, yeah, that... because um, I think it's like a. The question kind of put it this way is kind mm -hmm. of like, is there two mm -hmm. imperial scripts <laughs> or is there just one and a modern interpretation? And mm -hmm. I think you said that it's a one algorithm, the rescript is the rescript, and the translation is just the interpretation. So that, okay, so when he says this, actually he means this. So it mm -hmm. makes it more palatable. But mm -hmm. I think from your answer, mm -hmm. it seems as if the, the objective was always to restore the position of the original research. I think so, but they didn't really say we have to bring the rescue back into schools. Mm -hmm. So that's, <laughs> I don't know. That's, it's actually, there's a lot I don't know. Ambiguity. I think so. I think so. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, no, I was just fascinated at what they wanted to do with it then. So they're, they're selling these copies, mm -hmm. which people would buy and hang up in their homes or the. I don't know okay. that far, uh, but uh, I guess you, you want to show it. it and like, I don't know what people, I don't know what consumers did with a copy. Yeah. But I guess because you bought it, you want to really show it where, off. But where? Where do you put it? Or, oh, I don't know. Because you couldn't put it in a school, right? I mean, if, if a principal or a teacher just bought it and they put it in a public school, mm -hmm. that would be unconstitutional, would it? I see. Or, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't think it is unconstitutional. I know there are some school principals um, who... Um, displayed a copy in their office. Mm. So, um, but that's a good question. That's something I, I'm curious to learn more about. What do people do with those copies? How did, I don't know, average priests and their constituents uh, yeah. understood their 
um, restoration, something I'm not sure, I don't know about. Yeah. Again, I'm thinking of the US comparison of like, you know, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's always people kind of pushing at that. Like, mm -hmm. how far can we get you know, Christianity into the schools without mm -hmm. it becoming unconstitutional? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, is a Christmas tree unconstitutional? Mm -hmm. And like, you can imagine debates about whether a teacher can put that in their classroom and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, Jason. Yeah. Uh, thank you, for, thank you. for the fascinating talk. And uh, we really have so many questions. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I can talk about sure, sure. them another time. Mm -hmm. Um, but immediately, uh, I was struck by, I mean, really the number of questions that emerge once I consider like a global Cold War context mm -hmm. of this, uh, this sort of uh, post-war uh, processes that you described, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that there's a domestic political um, drive and also sort of uh, background or stage to all of these statements and mm -hmm. movements. Um, I think there's also, of course, a global um, mm -hmm. one, a regional one, that is a uh, Cold War, uh, I mean, to boil it down to two words, Cold War mm -hmm. um, context, right? And so I wondered, and it actually came up in Professor Kreitman's question a little bit too, I wondered about specifically anti-communism and the sort of, you know, uh, fear of perhaps the atheistic, the sort of like uh, anti-religious mm -hmm. um, aspects of what people under sometimes popularly understand to be communism, mm -hmm. and then also the sort of anti-national mm -hmm. or sort of anti-nationalist uh, again uh, perceptions popularly held about communism. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we can talk about how those re re perceptions may or may not be accurate, but mm -hmm. importantly, you know, this functions as a sort of um, you know. Uh, Oil or sort of the sector of communism is a sort of thing to situate one's own mm -hmm. position against, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you could talk about like, yeah, anti-communism as we saw it uh, in in Shinto uh, circles. Mm -hmm. And then my second question um, is of more about method. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered uh, if there is like an oral history aspect mm -hmm. to your project, if there was an oral history aspect to your project in the sense that you know, we could ask some of these people writing or speaking um, what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then if not, I wondered what your thoughts are on um, the possibility or opportunities for oral histories uh, on, I mean, the 60s broadly, but also, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the Shinto uh, nationalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Sorry, can you remind me the first question? Yeah, uh, Cold War context and anti communism. Oh, right, right. It was definitely um, uh, crucial. Um, it was crucial. Um, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that was part of the discourse uh, that I read in the bulletin. And when they criticized teachers, they, they basically painted the teachers as communists. Um, they always sort of connect the dots whenever they see what they, whenever they see I see problem, look at those teacher, that teacher, um, they, uh, he was, he or she was brainwashed by, by occupation uh, ideology. He, they're brainwashed by communism and they're not nationalistic. Why did it happen? Because of the occupation period. That's why we have to uh, get, uh, overcome it. So that idea of communism uh, was always there. I mean, this, the campus activism I showed, I mean, if you ask those students who got arrested, I don't think many of them identify as communism. I mean, they, they are basically trying to improve their campus. But, and also we know that uh, actually many of the students who got arrested, they are not University of Tokyo students. It was actually, it was a fact, we, and it was widely reported um, at the time. But the association ignored the fact. They basically said, look at those Tokyo University students, the elite students who are supposed to be patriots, supposed to be leading the nation. They were brainwashed by communism. Um, that's why we have to change. We have to restore. Sorry, I forgot what I'm trying to say here. Your question is about communism. So it was definitely there. And the second question, so oral history possibilities or your experience with oral history is trying to talk to the, to the actors of your, of your uh, history. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it never occurred to me. So that's really important. I don't know any oral history done about this. Certainly, I don't think there is any serious research done about this 
uh, restoration movement in the first place. And I have never encountered any research of oral history um, done about this, but that's that would be great if I can meet with uh, some of those leaders and ask. But I guess, we, I mean, it's pretty commonsensical, but we need to be sort of careful about how we approach them. And if they, I mean, maybe they look at my credential, I'm Japanese and educated in the US, they think I'm just liberal. They don't really want to open up to me. So um, it'll be great. It's a lot of work, but that I think uh, will bring about a lot of rewards. So. Thank you, thank you. I don't know, there is a lot of oral research, oral, oral history done about Shinto in general. Is that because scholars are more or less liberal? Uh, well, no, that doesn't, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of oral history about war memory, right? Like victims about mm -hmm. bombing and uh, oral history on those right wingers, do we like religious studies people must be doing ethnographies of Shinto shrines and things like not so much historical, oh, but certainly that's true. That there's people doing that. Um, I was going to ask about so Jolian came and gave a talk here a few years ago, mm -hmm. and he was working on something that is somewhat parallel to your project, mm -hmm. which is about these campaigns to kind of introduce moral education or mm -hmm. morality lessons, Dotoku, I think, mm -hmm. into schools in the post war. Presumably, you have similar actors who are, might be helping out in both campaigns and that from him correctly he was kind of saying that these were ba basically trying to smuggle Shinto back into the education by by concealing it as secular morality mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I want I wondered if there's going to overlap there and there's I think so and now I stand corrected earlier I said the association was not interested in putting the rescue back into school but if you read the petitions that they sent to prime ministers they were actually interested in that they said that we have to teach the risk script um, in schools. Yeah. There are no more specifics, but that was definitely part of the agenda. Thank you. Gabriel, you had a second question? Yes. Um, a second question is mm -hmm. about the role of the emperor mm -hmm. in all of this mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, and this is just the media, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, emperor uh, Hirohito, for example, had comments about less to me try. Mm. And also, they had a stance uh, about, about enshrining the war criminals. Mm -hmm. But did the emperor or any members of the imperial family ever comment on imperial respect on education? After the war? Yeah, in, in the context that we had discussed in 1916. No, no, not that I know of. Um, I doubt it. I, I doubt it. Right, about Yaskuni, I think when Tojo was um, enshrined, um, he, I remember Hirohito said something negative. He said, I cannot go visit anymore. So we know that but about this movement or about the rest script. No, I don't think. Um, I mean, of, officially, um, Showa Emperor, he denied the essence of the rest script in 1946. It was called the Humanity Declaration um, by order of the US occupiers. He gave, issued this statement uh, in which he said, I'm not a God anymore, I am a human being. Um, that was important to the occupiers. They thought that making the emperor say uh, is a clear negation of the rest script. So officially, I guess the Showa Emperor I mean, maybe he was not really interested in the rest script in the first place. And I don't think there's any, he was politically touching, so he didn't, I don't know. So, but th thank you. That's a great question. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, just to get a little better idea of mm -hmm. where the political support for this is coming from, are we really talking about the extreme right wingers within the LDP? And not the party as a whole, and and, and uh, presumably all the other parties that existed at the time would not um, have supported that. I don't think it was uh, on the extreme side. Like mainstream LDP politicians, they were 
interested in the rest group. I mean, you know, some of the examples I showed, it was Prime Minister Tanaka uh, who proposed restoration. Uh, we see uh, Minister of Education uh, also saying that. In the 1970s, at least, I don't think uh, it was uh, it was outliers who proposed. But at the same time, there's a bit of, I don't know, they always, those politicians, they always said we have to restore, but they will never go any further. So maybe they are just, you know, giving a lip service to the conservative um, supporters. I mean, we, we, we have this idea that prime ministers, they, they visit the Ascuni Shrine in order to make the association really firmly happy. So they maybe talk about the rest script to sort of garner some support. Maybe that's why, I mean, they knew that realistically, there's no way to legalize a rest script and there's no way to get national support. So maybe I'm guessing that this was their political strategy to sort of keep those conservatives happy. But to answer your question, um, mm -hmm. it was a mainstream politician in the 70s. Uh, I think all the time, 80s and 90s. I mean, we have Prime Minister Mori, for example. He didn't really talk about the rest grade, but he talked referred to the imperial ideology. In 2010s, we have uh, ministers, not Prime Minister Abe himself, but people around him you know, saying positive comments, making positive comments. So he was always there. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm curious to uh, hear more about how your research uh, on this uh, subject has changed since finishing the dissertation and then being uh, in Kyoto and Nishiko Kane. What uh, was Professor Green there? He was there, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Working on, you know, Yasukuni and post mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm just imagining. What limited exposure I have to that space, mm -hmm. I'm imagining like what's possible in terms of research and stuff there, right? So I'd be very interested to hear um, like what, what what changed or how you sort of come to think of things maybe differently or, or the same uh, since submitting the dis finishing the dissertation and continuing your research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I so this is more this project is more or less outgrowth of what I have been doing. Uh, I wrote my dissertation about uh, another object of emperor worship, about the official photograph of the emperor. And after uh, my dissertation uh, ended in 1948 during the occupation era. So in order to, you know, everybody tells you, you have to turn your dissertation into a book. And I was wondering, well, what am I supposed to do? Maybe I should maybe add a chapter about post-war Japan. So I did some research about that post, uh, the risk, sorry, the photograph in post war Japan. Um, I actually didn't find a lot about that topic, but I became more and more interested in the contrast between those two objects. I mean, in, before 1945, the photograph and the rescript, they were both mobilized together in imperial holiday ceremonies. After the war, the photograph was pretty much forgotten. Maybe that's why I didn't really find that interesting. It was not even an object of controversy, but the rest script, the more I learned about it, the, you know, the, the more controversial it became. So we, there is a lot of history uh, of controversy behind the rest script. And I was wondering why. So I was trying to write this post-war chapter by comparing these two. Um, at some point, I realized that maybe that's not practical. Maybe I'm trying to compare them because I want to write a book about the photograph. Maybe it's this project about the rest script. It's interesting in itself. Yeah. So that's how I sort of, it was a tough decision. So. I, I see the, the parallels, right? If they're both ta talismans or mm -hmm. those yeah. fetish objects and this mm -hmm. kind of thing that it, it's not just about which itself, it's kind of a whole set of political decisions stem from that. Mm -hmm. If it's placed in the school, then suddenly that opens up a whole debate that could be had mm -hmm. about what else can be put in schools, what, what other aspects of Shinto can be taught again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the wedge issue right there, kind of mobilizing. It's, kind of it's like a wedge issue there. It's like, a, like it's not just about the portrait, the picture of the rescript, mm -hmm. it's about 
once it's in the schools, like mm -hmm. especially in the schools, mm -hmm. then that can open the floodgates for a whole sort of discussions about, okay, now we can teach this, now this in the schools, uh -huh. and, and Shinto can be part of public life again. Right, right, right. So, mm -hmm. and the, the portrait of the emperor too had, had that role, right? You were talking Definitely. about mm -hmm. during the war, these stories about the teachers mm -hmm. allegedly running into to schools, to, to mm -hmm. burning schools to save the, the mm -hmm. portrait, and then right, right. sacrifice them. Yeah, so. I, I can see that uh, they're definitely connected. Well, um, do you think I can put this into my book on the portrait? I don't know. I'm getting greedy. I feel like maybe that's two different projects. Or at least the epilogue, maybe. Or... In epilogue, yeah. yeah. This book is about a photograph, but I have an interesting story yeah. to tell. About. <laughs> but, um, sorry, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, is uh, the other main religion in Japan mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. completely irrelevant to this uh, whole discussion because that is not an official state related um, religion where the, I mean, the Jinko, the emperor, was kind of by the cult. But um, do any of the Buddhist uh, movements have any position about that? Or are they, are they just, uh, is it just irrelevant to them? I think it's irrelevant as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I know uh, in the bulletins, uh, I remember this one anecdote where uh, um, basically they want to say everybody likes the rescript. Uh, I, I, and in, the, in this context, I read a um, piece that says this Shinto Buddhist monk, he actually reads the rescript, uh, not because of its religious value, but because it's a beautiful text. I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but in that context, um, we, so they, they, they wanted to sort of, they wanted to make Shinto what it used to be free for Japan. It's not a religion. It's just uh, part of nationalism, part of patriotism. Yeah. So in that context, we saw Buddhism showing up. But otherwise, I don't, I, I, I don't think I can make any other significant mm -hmm. connections. But where would I? Cormate or stand on this, for example. I, don't, I, don't I mean, know. Would, would they be sympathetic to this or would they see this as kind of a comment of today? Or yeah, well, yeah. I mean, if when the um the scandal at Osaka happened, like oh, what, oh, because they I were guess... they were silent, okay, <laughs> but they weren't opposed either, they weren't kind of, I think, officially, no, they did yeah. not oppose, but they were not they did not protest, maybe mainly because they were forming coalition with LD. Right. I mean, Kometo was historically against emperor worship. Mm. Um, Ikeda yeah. um, was very critical yeah. um, of emperor worship um, before the war, yeah. after the war. So I don't see any reason why they want yeah. to support the risk group. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I mean, if you think about their base and its values, socially conservative, anti-communist, mm -hmm. you could see how they might embrace this idea that the rescript is secular and that you know in it says it's, it's my enemies enemy, my friend that kind of thing you, you could see them at least being tacitly supportive for that if it's in a, a way to kind of push back on what they see as well, radical. Yeah, yeah i think it's possible yeah. it's possible i don't think they said that they said that far at the moment yeah. but yeah i think hmm. any more questions it's somewhat tangential, but I was struck by, um, so we had Professor Hikotani Takako was here mm -hmm. for a few years um, as a visit, visiting mm -hmm. um, professor. And she told a story about um, how her parents were both very conservative, sent her to a kind of a Catholic private school, mm -hmm. um, not because they were Christian at all, but because they thought that was the place where you should go to educate your kids to be anti-communist. Mm -hmm. And so there's a weird kind of coalition of people across faith boundaries but because they were all socially conservative and anti-communist and they, they had kind of something in common, I found that fascinating. Mm. Anyway. Uh, Jason, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if uh, I could ask you about something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, earlier in the presentation, mm -hmm. uh, where what I understand to be like a move from like, like a de-imperialization of identities, but also legal frameworks, de-imperialization becomes like nationalization. So rather than speak of like education for um, education for imperial subjects, we can talk about education for citizens. And you know the the role of of a Japanese 
uh, citizen in the mm -hmm. first word period is defined in relationship to the government and it's a more inclusive language that isn't about responsibility to the emperor but a responsibility mm -hmm. to a government and mm -hmm. importantly that government is you know founded by and of or for and of or something citizens mm -hmm. um, so there's that um and i wonder then uh, sorry you are uh, jason you are referring to the translation or well i think the translation is evidence of that mm -hmm. but yeah i mean in terms of in in relation to the translation, particularly how language moves from being sort of imperial mm -hmm. to sort of national mm -hmm. and the sort of different relationships of citizens and subjects mm -hmm. to those two separate, mm -hmm. I mean, ideas, but also like political structures. Mm -hmm. right? So there's that. And I wonder then if if you wanted, if you could tell me more about how you understand patriotism then in these two different ways, like how different is patriotism um, in these contexts? Uh, pre war and post war, and your thoughts on that would be really helpful for me. Patriotism for Shinto priests or patriotism in, in, the, in society? Probably how Shinto priests understand patriotism, but patriotism for like you and I, or like someone that's just like mm -hmm. living in Japan, I guess. Mm -hmm. But you said generic patriotism. Right, so right, like, right. What, is that more inclusive or more limited than a pre war patriotism? Oh. Thank you, Jason. That's a great question. This version of patriotism, as you can see in this 1972 translation, I don't think this is what they wanted. This is sort of like a con their, con their effort to conceal what's politically incorrect in the text. Uh, if you read other articles in the bulletin, they are pretty consistent about what they wanted to do. I mean, they wanted to make Shinto the way it used to be before the war. So for their patriotism was that people revere the nation maybe through their worship um, of the emperor and through their uh, Shinto associated traditions, visiting shrines, I don't know, maybe reading the script, that I'm not sure, but visiting shrines and doing everything Shinto. So that that's the uh, that's their version of patriotism. And again, going back to the issue of Buddhism, you know, Shinto isn't really a religion. It, it, I, I I I read I read them often say that Shinto is the sort of is ingrained in Japanese life naturally, something like that. So the idea was that it's not really religion; it's just Japanese. Sorry, Jason. So how is how is post-war discourse, particularly Shinto leadership statements in these bulletins and elsewhere, like how are they dealing with the idea that 30, 40 years before they're speaking, uh, Shinto is a thing that's inclusive of many more people than Japanese. I mean, inclusive of, for example, colonized Korean subjects, mm -hmm. Taiwanese people, like how do they narrow the, the scope of Shintoism and exclude from that group? Mm, what do you mean by narrowing? Well, like keep making Shinto, reducing Shinto to the main Japanese islands again, again. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I see. I see. I don't. Please correct me if I'm not responding to your question. I don't see them trying to narrow their scope. For them, Shinto. Is at the heart of all the Japanese, right? They don't talk much about Koreans. They don't talk much about, but I do know. Hmm, I know that they want to. They, they praise the red script because some uh, another anecdote that I read was that there are many foreigners who love the red script, and one article from 1965. This is a little strange. They said that um, this year about 15,000 international I mean, foreigners want to be naturalized as Japanese. And why? Because they love Japan. They love Japan, Japanese rescript and education. There's nothing scientific here. Um, they mean Koreans? They mean uh, Korean. Taiwanese was a major uh, constituent, according to that article. A lot of Taiwanese now want to be Japanese because they value these traditional Japanese values embodied in the rescript. Mm -hmm. Or we see uh, stories of Germans like this J former German soldier who fought against Japan in World War I, uh, who, uh, was, who was exposed to the rescript uh, while he was held prisoner. 
and now he loved it. So now in Germany, he makes, I guess, West Germany, he makes copies and distributes copies to his families and friends. So in that sense, to them, I think Rescript and Shinto is universal. So, sorry, Jason, does that respond to yeah, your comment? So fast there. We're, we're nearly out of time, but I can't resist asking one more question, which is about the kind of generational and cohort policy mm. in that you can see how in 1970 or so um i think of people the shrine managers being basically oji-san mm. elderly right mm -hmm. the students are fairly young generally mm -hmm. and so there's a kind of generational politics there about in 1970 you know a certain generation of japanese can point to the students occupying mm -hmm. campuses and say, are oh, the kids these days, they didn't learn the risk of school like we did. Mm -hmm. We bring the risk back, it will sort of teach them how to behave properly, right? And the politicians also, most people in public life mm -hmm. would have learned it themselves in school, right? Mm -hmm. Before 45. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point that drops off, right? But once you get to Murito Gakuen, like no one in politics in Japan has actually right. learned it themselves. Something changes there, right? Once you're talking about reviving something that people remember learning themselves, and talk and rise that you know no no one's actually learned to make different memories. So when's that moment, that generational moment where it kind of that memory fades away? I would guess the 80s or 90s, maybe 90s. But even the 70s, I I mean, thank you for bringing that up because that was one of my hypotheses when we think when I thought about why the the movement subsided. There was something generational about it. And I didn't talk about it because I have no evidence to confirm it. But for example, this um, book, uh, it's official recollection of the company history. They actually said that. And in the 1970s, most of the guys who founded the bulletin, who founded the association, they were gone. So now they were sort of lost. They didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So maybe I thought one of the reasons why the restoration didn't really get a lot of interest was that People didn't really know what the rest of it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and also there was an economic boom in the 1970s, so maybe people. Hmm. We're out of time, I'm afraid. But okay. Please join me in uh, thanking. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone.